All right, so here is my uh, swag that I brought back from Japan. I wish I could have brought 10 times more than this, but as you can see, high quality handmade tools, well, they cost a fortune. And this right here is about $1,500, which I know a lot of you think I'm crazy, but this is what I do for a living. And these tools bring me so much joy that yeah, they're worth $1,500 all day to me. This one I brought back for my wife. She's a kitchen samurai, needed to have a nice tool. And it is just phenomenal, beautiful, hand hammered patina, plus all the layered steel coming down to that cutting edge right there with this black wood handle. I don't even know what this wood is, but uh, it's probably like a dyed wood maybe but it's just art. All hand tap signatures in there, whatever Japanese kanji that is. Don't know what it says, it might. It's probably just the date, but it looks awesome. And when the sun just hits those layers, oh, just so sharp. So I thought this would just be the perfect shape for like a paring knife. My wife, she absolutely loves it. Whoa, take it easy there. She keeps it in the box on the windowsill. And then we've got inch and a half or 36 mil Tasai polished finish tataki nomi, which is a timber chisel, so it's larger tim ch chisel. And then we got a Funahiro timber chisel. Funahiro typically makes planes. He's considered the master of planes in Japan, but he also makes chisels. And we got a timber chisel from him as well. This is um, 27 mil or I think. No, I'm not sure exactly, but it's about an inch, just over an inch. A little bit longer handle on the Funahiro as well as the blades a little bit longer. But that finish on that Tasai, all hand filed, hand hammered ring around there. That's just a work of art. And both of these just take an insane razor edge. Then we've got this. I don't even know the name of this plane, but it's the Swedish blue steel that Funahiro uses to make his plane. He makes it all sorts of different types of planes, different names, different steels. Um, but I've always wanted to try one with the Swedish steel because Swedish steel is amazing. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you guys exactly how I set up my 70 mil Japanese hand plane. So this is a brand new plane right out of the box. The box itself is absolutely gorgeous. I'm putting a coat of lacquer on it right now because it comes unfinished and I don't want it to get all smudged with dirty finger pins. All right, so here's a close up look of the back of the blade. Here's the bevel. Now this part of the body is all soft wrought iron. And you can see that that thin little laminated layer there, that is the tool steel, the cutting edge right there. It's only a couple mils thick, 16th of an inch or so. You can see when you look at the side of the blade, that the blade tapers in thickness from the thickest point to the thinner point. As well as when you bring the blade and you look at the back side, hard to see on camera here, but there is a slight cup in the back of the blade, a real small amount, about 16th or a couple mils um, cup on the back side of the blade, which helps prevent the blade from, once that's seated in there and the block is carved to match that curve on the back, the blade can't wiggle around in the block. It's set in there beautifully. Because this blade relies on pressure fit from the wood, these little edges that sit, catch the front edge of the blade and then the back that's the only thing that's supporting the blade. There's no screws or tightening methods other than pressure fit against the block. So on the front side here, this is called the Ura. And this part of the steel blade is actually slightly hollow ground so that the only part that's gonna touch your stone is that front cutting edge, which means you don't have to abrade that whole surface in order to get your, your blade lapped perfectly flat. So it saves you an insane amount of time on the sharpening stones. That's why the Japanese use this hollow ground technique on their chisels as well as their plane blades. 
And the reason why they use this soft iron, in my opinion, um, um, because we know that you know buying tool steel to make this whole blade out of tool steel wouldn't be that much more expensive nowadays. But I've learned that from sharpening my uh, chisel of power, the chisel that Damascus chisel that Alex Steele sent me, which is made completely out of tool steel, uh, he's sharpening that chisel is an absolute biatch compared to sharpening a blade that's laminated like this with the softer iron because this soft iron cuts like, like nothing. It's like butter on a sharpening stone. And so that tiny amount of tool steel is the hardest part to sharpen and that only that little, little strip that's showing there, it sharpens beautifully compared to a, if this whole blade was made out of hardened tool steel abrading that surface and getting it flat and sharpening it back would just take so much more time. Like I spent hours trying to sharpen my, the Alex Steele chisel that he sent me and as beautiful as that thing is, oh, sharpening, what a chore. So that's the reason why I believe the Japanese still use this lamination technique is just because it's just ease of sharpening. Now put the blade aside for a second, chip breaker aside. Here's your block, the die they call it. Beautiful Japanese white oak, pretty simple, just a chunk of wood, nothing more to it. Um, most of them have these chip breakers, some of them don't. That's about as complicated as it gets. So, the reason why Japanese planes can take such beautiful thin shavings is because of the way they condition the sole of their blade and obviously how they sharpen their blade as well. So with a typical standard, you know, steel bodied plane, you're just going to have a machined flat surface on the bottom of that plane from end to end, usually within a thousandth of an inch. Whereas the Japanese know that obviously this wood block is going to shift a little bit and, and warp and different humidity and it's going to change. So you have to constantly be tuning in. And the Japanese are always tuning the soles of their planes to make sure that they're running beautifully. So the way in which the Japanese condition the bottom of their plane is they actually, similar to the hollow grind on the blades, they put a hollow on the sole of their plane. So the only parts that are actually coming in contact with the wood surface that they're planing is about a centimeter or so at the front and about a centimeter or so before the blade. Uh, some people, depending on your preference, will relieve this whole back section. But I think most carpenters will leave a small surface at the back just so that your blade doesn't snipe. Not that you would ever see the snipe when you're taking five micron shavings. So this part is in contact with the wood so as well as this and this. And then this whole surface in here is relieved. And then this whole surface right here is relieved away about a millimeter or a couple thicknesses of paper. So they have a special scraper planes to do that. But a lot of people have a lot of different methods. Not everybody uses a scraper plane. I happen to have one. Here's my scraper plane. It's just a little plain blade with the wedged vertically in the block with a slight skew on it. And you just use that to scrape across the grain in order to remove that material. And that works fairly well. This is what the Japanese have been using for centuries. But what I noticed everybody using at this uh, Kazuro Kai conference in Japan, not everybody, but a bunch of people were using these, which is just a razor blade pinched in this little, this guy had a whole bunch of them made up. He was selling them. And it's just basically a hand scraper that uses your, your razor blade to scrape the surface flat. And I thought that was awesome and it worked like a, worked like a charm for me. So this is kind of my new little tool here. It's this little razor blade clamp. So what that does is basically removes any kind of friction on the majority of the sole of the plane so that the only Airy surface area you have to worry about being flat is this tiny little strip here, here, and there, which makes conditioning the bottom of your plane way easier. 
And there's a lot of fine tuning that's involved if you want to take a five micron shaving. Jeez. All right, so let's get into this. Take out the chip breaker. Now you can see these are kind of, they've been japanned or lacquered or whatever. I don't know exactly what the black oily finish is on there, but it's kind of got an oily finish that smudges right here. So all there is to it, you don't have to adjust the, the notches at all because the blade is parallel this way. But I've got enough wiggle that way that I know I, I won't need to adjust the sides of these notches at all. It's just all in the back right here. That's all you need to do. So I'm just going to take my chisel and the spots that have got the oil marks on them. I'm just going to just shave those down. Ever so slightly. The method that I was taught by a tea house builder way back in 2007, a course I took through the Timber Framers Guild was basically you want your blade to be like three solid hits, like bam, bam, bam. And then it should be coming through. And it just about is right now. So I think that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. I think I can just, there, now I'm starting to see the blade. So there's this, this part of the angle goes down and then in the higher end die blocks like this, they put a little bottom ledge that covers the bevel so that it actually sits on the back and on the bevel, which is more just an aesthetics thing. It really doesn't serve any purpose other than it just makes the slot on the bottom smaller, makes it look a lot cleaner and neater. You can see the little ledge right there. I'm just kind of shaving that down. Just so it doesn't get in the way. Now if you can see it or not. Just see the blades. Coming out of there, just the tiniest bit. So now that you got the plain blade set in there, then you want to fit the chip breaker. So you want this blade to sit. You don't want it back at all from that aura, or else that's a gap where your shavings will get clogged in there. You want it right up on that edge. So I hold my blades together like that and then you want to hold them up to the light and look through this crack in the back here to see if you can see any light coming through that joint. And then as I sharpen this, I'll, that'll be lapped flat and I'll lap this extra as well to make sure they're both flat. They look like they're pretty bang on right now. but. The sharpening process that I'll go through will make sure that those fit. All right, so this should go fairly quickly because the blade's already been kind of basic sharpened. So my sharpening setup is all synthetic Shapton stones. Some of these old like pro ones, the wood blocks on them. Uh, some of them are glass stones. The Shapton glass, they're all totally dirty, but there's a glass plate on the back of this one and yeah some of them are just these Shapton Pro this is my 30,000 grit final sharpening stone that puts quite a polish on the blade I must say so I've got them all set up on my little sharpening station here with my water trays underneath and then I use my little bamboo dripper just to get the uh, water going. And I got a little sliver of wood 
wedged in the hole, drilled in this little gusset here in the bamboo. And then I can just pull that in and out to adjust the, the drips. And then I use a, this is actually a 140 grit, a Toma plate, a Toma diamond plate that I use to flatten my stones. Super fast cutting. So I got 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 12,000, 16,000, 30,000. Definitely more stones than you need to put a beautiful edge, but I just happen to love sharpening. So I know they're flat when all, all of the marks, the iron filings marks come off. So I'm going to start on the 1000 grit because I'm pretty sure this bevel's already pretty flat. I just do a little figure eight stroke. Cuts the fastest in my opinion. But I switch it up a lot as well. So I just got a rag here, clean off my bevel. Yeah, it looks like we're pretty flat all the way along, so I can go to uh, 2000 now. So you want to see that even cut, 1000 grit, you know, kind of smoky finish all the way across your bevel. If your bevel's not flat, you'll see the little wear spots where it is flattening out and then you'll see around the edges where if you need to go further to get right to the edge, cutting edge as well as the full bevel. Really the polish only needs to be on your cutting edge so you don't, if your bevel is rounded or you don't have to get right to the, to the heel of the bevel but you want to make sure that you have a nice even polish along that cutting edge, no matter what. Now with the Shapton stones get a little stickier as the grits go up. It takes a little bit more skill to kind of keep that bevel flat. But having a flat bevel from the heel to the toe also gives you a more stable platform to kind of sharpen off. Sharpen. So here I'll start to flatten the ura a little bit. The way I do that is the lamination for the the blade steel stops just about here right below the, the maker stamps. So I can see where the hollow grind is, has begun and I'll just use my fingers as a guide and kind of pinch the blade on either side where I want it to stop. And then I'll use my fingers on the edge of the stone kind of like a fence so that I'm not, the blade's not moving around and I'm not polishing up onto the nice finished maker's stamp area. Once you get up to the 5,000, that's when your polish really starts to show the flatness of the blade. 2,000 was kind of going right across. It looked perfectly flat, but once you go to 5,000, then we're talking like microns for the polish as far as the flatness across your bevel. And so the mirror really starts to shine at 5,000, and you can see exactly how flat your bevel actually is. So I got a little bit more work to do here. Looks like a lot of work, but it's not. It's really close. It'll maybe take me another minute or two on the 5,000, and that polish will go right 
edge to edge. Uh, some people use like natural stones or Nagura stones, which are like a little stone you rub on here to get a paste going that supposedly helps you with the polish, but I was able to take a 16 micron shaving using this sharpening process, which is pretty good. The whole, the whole reason actually, well not the whole reason, but one of the main reasons why I wanted to compete in the Kazuro Kai planing competition in Japan was to see the difference between sharpening with natural stones and synthetic stones. Is there a huge difference? Is it night and day? Can somebody who sharpens with synthetic stones only, can they compete? you know, with these masters that sharpen on these natural stones that are mined in Japan and there's all sorts of different mines and types of stone and the polishes, it's like a whole trade unto itself just understanding the, the sharpening stones, the natural stones and the grits and the colors and which mines produce the best stones, it's quite something. And I've never been able to afford or understand how to how to get the right stones because a lot of them are expensive you could pay a thousand dollars for one stone that's like you know a super high polished grit stone and I can't afford that so that's why I've always just stuck with my synthetic stones and I was pretty pumped to get a 16 micron shaving you know the best at the competition was about five and I'm still kind of wondering if Maybe if just my sharpening technique gets a little better. Like maybe if I just flatten the stone more often as I'm sharpening, I'll be able to get down to five microns. Or if it is an actual finishing stone grit kind of a thing, you have to get your edge to a certain polish for it to be able to take five microns. I don't know, but I was pretty happy with 16. And for those of you guys who are newcomers to this channel, are like, what is this guy talking about? 16 micron shavings? What the heck? Um, I was just at a planing competition in Japan where they measured the thickness of these shavings. That's the whole point of the competition is to take the thinnest shaving. Oh, so much fun. Uh, and they use these micrometers to measure them. And like a blood cell is like, I think, 8 microns or something like that. Human hair is like 40 to 50 microns. So we're talking really thin, thin shavings. And your sharpening and your plain block tuning have to be absolutely on the money in order to take shavings that small. And that's kind of the test, is to test your skill as to whether or not you know your tools well enough that you can adjust them to take shavings that thin. And the other point uh, for taking a shaving that thin is when you're taking shavings that are so thin you can barely see them, uh, the t the, you will tear out the wood way less because the amount of wood that you're lifting off the surface is so thin that there's very little room for the grain to tear because it's, it's not removing a lot of wood at, a t at one time. So you get a beautiful polished finish on the surface of the wood. And that's the whole point of the Japanese finishing plane. They don't use sandpaper over there. They just finish plane the surface. And they want it to be smooth as glass when they're done. So you can see there's still, you know, a scratch pattern on the blade. But that's a 30,000 grit polish. All right, so now let's condition the sole of this die.
And when you put your straight on edge on there, you should see daylight everywhere except for your flat surfaces. Those should all be touching. What I do to ensure that there's no twist in the block, that's hard to tell. So I just take a sheet of 600 grit sandpaper, put it on a flat surface like a machined tabletop or your planer. From there, I take my 30,000 grit stone and I polish these surfaces here. All right, so this is a piece of spruce two by four from the lumber yard. Flatten it out here. That is nice. So this is the old, I'd say that feels pretty good for a lumber yard two by four. Thin. This is a piece of yellow cedar here. I don't know. The grain is a bit wonky on it. I don't know if it'll play, but actually it'll be a good test. So take a shaving like that. Zero tear out. It's putting like a glassy polish on the wood. Taking ridiculous. Shavings. Almost got all that tarot out. Now let's see what it does when we flip the wood around and go against the grain. Definitely feel a little more tension going against the grain. Still putting a glass polish, no tear out. So I think my blade's still just a wee bit too tight. And the uh, oil that's kind of rubbed off that was kind of on the blade as it was brand new, it's not there so much anymore. So, I'd, so the best way to do that is just, so the best way to make sure that this surface scuffs and marks this is just to take a pencil and shade the back of your, your plane. that it's left a nice big scuff. All right, now let's see how this plane works on walnut. Typically Japanese planes are used on softwood, hinoki or Japanese cypress, because that's what they build with. They build their homes and temples with softwood. So their planes are designed to cut softwood beautifully, but they're also designed to be pretty tough. And I don't think they'll have any problem shaving. Hardwood. I think I'm going against the grain here. So 
even walnut it's taken some pretty beautiful thin shavings and that was against the grain with absolutely no tear out and a pretty see the grain on here is pretty ornery the big old knot on the one end. It puts a pretty fine polish on that as well. It's a little hard to see, but uh, you can kind of get an idea for the light coming through there. All right, so there's just a half inch there, there, and at the end where you shouldn't see any light coming through. All right, so that pretty much sums up how you set up your Japanese block plane. If you have any other questions about the setup, leave them in the comments below. I'll be happy to uh, answer them as long as they're legit. I guess any questions legit, really. I'm pretty sure I covered everything, but ultimately the most time is going to be spent just tuning the bottom of your block. And once that's dialed in and you got a sharp blade, well, the fun begins. A couple videos back, I put up a poll card in my video asking which project do you guys want me to start next, and I'm pretty sure, I haven't checked recently, but out of the four different projects, the coffee table was what people wanted to see the most, and then next to that, that it was renovation update videos, which you're going to be getting some of that too. So I'm going to be starting on a coffee table, I'm making actually a tree cookie coffee table, which is kind of cool, I've never made one of those before. Going to have to do a little bit of chainsaw work. So yeah, guys, I hope you're enjoying this content. If you are, please give it a like. Don't forget to check me out on Instagram. I'm popping up as many pictures as I can there daily. So if you want a little samurai fix every day or every other day, I'm obviously not, I just can't get videos out every day or every other day. I'm not Alex Steele, a friggin' limitless bundle of energy. Man, where's that guy get it? I'm pretty sure he's doing coke, but hey, I won't judge. Once again, huge thank you to my Samurai Brotherhood, all the brothers and sisters that help support this channel and make these videos possible. Thank you so much, you guys. And until the next video, Samurai out.